Welcome to our St Gabriel's Worship from Home for this week. It is great to welcome you for our time of worship together here online. Wherever you are joining us from, you are very welcome. Over the next 30 minutes or so, we will pray, we will sing songs, we will confess and we will reflect on the scriptures. Uh, online worship is an expression of St Gabriel's and we, whilst we um, use some of the same songs and we use the same scriptures, uh, we don't always do it in the same format as we do in our uh, on-site worship. But this is our online worship. It is a special time, holy moment for us to come together. You can find out all about the life of St Gabriel's, what we're doing in the week and on Sundays by subscribing to our newsletter, scanning the QR code below or clicking the links. And if you are a regular worshipper with us on uh, our online worship, please think about giving either a weekly donation, uh, a monthly donation or just a one-off donation. Uh, um, church runs solely on donations and regular givers. And also, we would love to pray for you and you can send in your prayer requests or put them in the comments below and let us know what we can pray for you. But as we come into this time of worship, we pray. Come, Holy Spirit, fill our hearts and the hearts of our faithful, your faithful people and kindle in us the fire of your love through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, we're going to sing our first song of praise together. In my wrestling, in my doubts, in my failures, you won't walk out. Your great love will lead me through. You are the peace in my troubled sea. Oh, you are the peace in my troubled sea. Silence, you won't let go. In the questions, your truth will hold. Your great love will lead me through. You are the peace in my troubled sea. Oh, you are the peace in my troubled sea.
having praised God in song and lifted our hearts. We recognise that we don't always live up to God's uh, faithful ways. We don't always do what we are told. We don't always love others as we wish to be loved. And we don't always do the things we say we're going to do. They are the things that Jesus called sin. And we take a moment to privately confess those things before doing so publicly. When the Israelites, God's chosen people, confessed, they turned to him publicly and wailed and confessed. So we confess by saying, Father, we have sinned against heaven and against you. We are not worthy to be called your children. We turn to you again. Have mercy on us. Bring us back to yourself as those who were once dead, but now have life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And because God loved the world so much that he sent his only son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins, may you know the forgiveness of the Father through the death of Jesus his Son. May you live in the power of the Holy Spirit now and always. Amen. Well, having um, sung, having confessed, we're going to open up the scriptures together. We're going to read from the Bible, from the book of Acts, and then we're going to reflect on that. So let us open up the scriptures together. So we reflect on the Bible and our series in Acts. We are journeying in our summer series on Acts where we are looking at Paul's missionary journeys over the next six weeks. There's a time of uh, holiday involved in that as well. So over the next three weeks of our worship online, we will be having uh, some reflection questions based on our Bible reading rather than a full sermon as part of our worship. This week we are focusing on Paul's first missionary journey in Acts and to help us do that we are going to be using uh, some material from Eyewitness Bible which we use every Wednesday at our um, home group, our small group where we study the Bible. It's two actors who will be exploring um, Paul's first missionary journey uh, for us and reflecting on it. But before we do that let's open up the scriptures. Uh, we're reading from Acts as we have been most of the year. We're reading from uh, chapter 12 verse 22 onwards. So if you have a Bible there please open it up with you. So Acts 12 verse 22. The people kept shouting the voice of God and not of a mortal and immediately because he had not given the glory to God an angel of the Lord struck down Herod and he was eaten by worms and died. But the word of God continued to advance and gain adherence. Then after completing their mission, Barnabas and Saul returned to Jerusalem and brought with them John, whose other name was Mark. Now, in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manon, a member of the court of Herod, the ruler, and Saul. While they were worshipping the Lord, Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then, after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So, being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had John also assist them. When they had gone through the whole of the island as far as Pathos, they met a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. He was the pro-council Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man who summoned, summoned Barnabas and Saul and wanted to hear the word of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
So now let us watch and enjoy this reflection on Paul's first missionary journey. About 16 years after the resurrection of Jesus, Paul and I were with the church at Antioch worshiping and fasting. Now this was shortly after Paul and I returned from taking famine relief from the Antioch church to Jerusalem. We believed we had received approval in Jerusalem from the apostles and James to continue our work evangelizing the Gentiles, and we were anxious to do so. But in retrospect, maybe we hadn't really gotten a green light, but a yellow light. It was more than 15 years after the resurrection of Jesus before the Christians made a determined effort to take the gospel to ethnic groups other than the Jews. The major first effort to do so is often called the first missionary journey. The Holy Spirit said that the church at Antioch should set Paul and me apart for his work. None of us were sure what he meant by that, but the brothers placed hands on us and then sent us and John Mark on our way. We didn't know where we were going, didn't know we would be gone about a year and a half. From Antioch, the Holy Spirit led us a dozen miles down to Seleucia. From there, we sailed about 90 miles to the east end of the island referred to as Kittim in the Old Testament, the island of Cyprus. Ah, to be back on my home island, so many friends and relatives. We arrived at the city of Salamis, where we proclaimed the word of God. The city had an extensive population of Jews, as attested by the multiple synagogues, and this set a pattern of us sharing the good news to the Jew first, then for the Gentile, as Paul would later write. We knew there were already Christians on the island because they had previously traveled to Antioch to share the gospel. We traveled another hundred miles through the island on a Roman road until we arrived at the west coast city of Paphos. Now in Paphos, we met a Jewish sorcerer and false prophet named Alemus, or Bar-Jesus. Now, being a sorcerer was not allowed by the law of Moses, but local Jews didn't care enough to do anything about it. Alemus was the attendant of the Roman proconsul Sergius Paulus, so uh, he did have some local authority. Sergius Paulus heard Paul preach and explain the scriptures, and he became a believer. Now, since Elemus knew that was the end of his good deal, he tried to turn Sergius Paulus from the faith. Paul, full of the Holy Spirit, rebuked Elemus, made him go blind. This made Sergius Paulus even more of a believer. Sergius Paulus had us to dinner one night, and he told us about his relatives who lived near Pisidia in the province of Galatia. He was hopeful we'd go to them, tell them about the Lord Jesus and the Holy Spirit indicated that was where we should go next. From Paphos, we sailed to Perga in Pomphylia, a Roman province on the south coast of Asia Minor. And uh, it was there one of the saddest things in my life happened. John Mark decided to abandon us, go back to Jerusalem. He made his excuses. It broke my heart. I mean, he might never grow up to be a real man. I could tell John Mark just did not have the same level of trust in the Holy Spirit that Paul and I had, and that broke my heart too. It is easy for you to judge John Mark for wimping out, but travel in our time was difficult, incredibly hazardous. We had reached an especially treacherous place. We didn't have fancy cars, paved highways, or jet planes. When we traveled by foot, which was most of the time, we could only make 15 to 20 miles per day. And that is, if a Roman road was available. We were getting ready to travel on a new road called Sebast that had only recently been built. Sometimes we would have a donkey carry our supplies, food and water, but often we just did so ourselves. Bandits, robbers, were a constant hazard on many roads. And they, they would physically harm you, as well as take your belongings. Only a few places to lodge were on the roads, and. Those few that existed were usually more like dirty brothels with bad food. We often spent the night outdoors. And the weather, 
Weather was a constant concern, hot in the summer, cold in the winter, windy and unpredictable. We had arrived in Perga in the late summer of 46 AD, just before the autumn winds hit, and sailing became treacherous. Now, the area around Perga was low-lying, and many people contracted malaria there. Many scholars believe Paul contracted malaria at that place. And that was bad enough, but in the distance loomed the massive Taurus Mountains, and the autumn weather would soon be a hazard. We were getting ready to enter a dangerous and unknown phase of our trip. Even I was apprehensive. But Paul did not want to hear any of John Mark's excuses or reasons. He was so angry. He didn't even say goodbye to him. I had some crosswords with Paul and it soon became apparent that Paul now considered himself the leader of our group. I acquiesced because my judgment about John Mark was seemingly faulty. And because Paul was demonstrating his faith more and more powerfully. I was on a mission for the Holy Spirit. I didn't have time to coddle someone who wasn't fully committed to our cause. It seemed to me that John Mark should just go back to Jerusalem and bother Peter instead of me. My mind was set on going to Pisidian Antioch to meet the relatives of Sergius Paulus. I, I didn't uh, tell Barnabas at the time, but it, uh, I was getting very sick and I was worried about traveling. We were going to cross the Taurus Mountains. It was very dangerous. I knew that going would be tough for 100 miles. I admit I may have had ulterior motives for evangelizing in the places we did. First, unlike Cyprus, this territory had not been evangelized by anyone else. Second, I was a little concerned that the Christians in Jerusalem were not excited about us evangelizing the Gentiles, so I, I wanted to present them with a finished product that they could not deny. What I did not think about was that John Mark might unwittingly relay information about our trip to the church in Jerusalem. So some of them would be already moving to thwart our work. We crossed the Taurus Mountains. We're nearly to the huge Roman province of Galatia. We first entered the city of Antioch near Presidia, one of 16 cities named after Antiochus, the son of one successor to Alexander the Great. It's different from the Antioch of Syria that we had left from to start the journey. We attended the synagogue in Pisidian Antioch, our normal first action. And as was the custom, after the law and the prophets were read, the synagogue rulers asked for visitors if they had any, uh, anything to offer. I'm sure they were expecting a polite greeting from Jerusalem when, when I stood up. Instead, they got a history of the Jews that would rival the one Stephen gave the Sanhedrin. And that's where I got the idea. So. The Jews were very interested in what we had to say, and many of them became believers in Jesus. In the coming weeks, we continued to share the gospel and made many more believers. But some Jews became antagonistic, especially because we were treating the Gentiles as if they were equal to Jews. <laughs> it got so bad that the city leaders finally expelled us from the region. Well, after shaking the dust from our feet, as Jesus advised, we moved on content in the knowledge that the church in Pisidian Antioch was firmly established. And more exciting, even though the believers were mostly Gentiles, they were full of the Holy Spirit. Many synagogues had um, a number of Gentiles who stayed on the fringes of Judaism. They were attracted to monotheism and other practices, but did not want to strictly follow the laws of Moses, uh, especially getting circumcised. That practice was abhorrent to most ethnic groups, besides being very painful. These Gentiles were known as God-fearers. I specifically addressed them in Acts 13. When these God-fearers uh, converted to Christianity, the Jews lost their status and authority over them. 
Further, it, it offered the God-fearers a way to salvation without going through the rituals of becoming Jews. And it was probably the conversion of the God-fearers that really made the Jews angry. However, it made the God-fearers glad. <laughs> Now that you know about God-fearers, you can better understand the pattern of teaching that we used in Pisidian Antioch and would use for the next 20 years. First, we would go to the synagogue in a town and teach the Jews. With their background in the Old Testament, it was simple for them to comprehend the basic messages about God and Jesus being the Messiah. And from there, it's a small leap to teach them the entire gospel message. And because we were at the synagogues, we could access many of the God-fearers. Then, through the God-fearers, we had an approach to other Gentiles. Of course, the Holy Spirit would often open avenues to preach more directly to the Gentiles. After leaving Pisidian Antioch, we traveled 90 miles on the newly built Via Sebaste and arrived in Iconium. We continued our pattern, going to the synagogue first, but the Jews continued their pattern of opposing us <laughs> and persecuting us. They hatched a plot to stone us, which was against the law, but we heard about it and, and left the region. But once again, <laughs> we left behind many believers in the Lord Jesus. And we continued about 20 miles on the Via Sebeste and arrived in the Roman colony of Lystra at one family really stood out among the disciples we made there. A, a Jewish mother and grandmother, Eunice and Lois. They had a measure of faith that we had seldom seen. Uh, they became such fervent believers that we would begin receiving letters from them, uh, giving us updates on the status of the churches in, in Galatia. Also in Lystra, we saw a man who had been lame since birth. I looked at him intently and the Spirit revealed that this man had the faith to be healed. I told him, stand on your feet. He jumped up and began to walk. Remembering the persecution Jesus got for healing a man lame from birth, I was a little concerned about what would happen. To say that I was surprised by what happened next would be an understatement. The people were so impressed that they started calling Barnabas and me by the, by the names of Roman gods. The priest of Zeus, who, whose temple was just outside the city, brought bulls and wreaths to offer sacrifices to us. The crowd was speaking in Laconian language, but, but we figured out what was happening, and Barnabas and I went crazy. We, we, we tore our clothes and pled with them to understand we were ordinary men like them except we were empowered by Jesus and the Holy Spirit. I didn't understand the, the, the psychology of disappointed crowds. The, the same Jews we had angered in Iconium and Pisidian Antioch stirred up the disappointed crowd and turned them against us. Instead of wanting to sacrifice to us, the crowd decided they wanted to sacrifice us. They stoned me. Left me for dead outside the city. But the Spirit had future plans for me. When the disciples gathered around and, and prayed, I came to life. I went to Derby the next city, 60 miles away. Think about that. Paul was stoned and left for dead by people who meant to kill him. And it appeared they had succeeded, even to me. Certainly, he must have had broken bones and damage to his internal organs, and yet he was healed and ready to immediately travel. God, what a miracle. Now you know why the disciples call him son of encouragement. <laughs> but come to think of it, why didn't the people of Lystra stone him instead of me? We hadn't been there long enough for them to like him better, like all the other places where we traveled. But the Galatian Christians would forever remember what I had suffered to bring them the gospel. In Derby, Barnabas and I made more disciples. 
But we didn't get to stay long. The Holy Spirit revealed that our journey in Galatia was at an end. He knew that we had to start back in order to get to Antioch before the bad autumn weather prevented our sailing. But we knew we had been blessed so much in working among the Galatians that the Lord had clearly shown that our future work was going to be among the Gentiles, not the Jews. Barnabas and I backtracked from Derby to Lystra to Iconium to Pisidian Antioch. We strengthened the believers in those churches and appointed elders and left them with instructions to avoid false teaching, especially from the Jews. We were very concerned that these Gentiles were living in poverty, surrounded by false idols. They didn't have the Old Testament like the Jews. And the New Testament had not yet been written. And if we had known that it would be two or three years before we'd return, we would have been even more concerned about the false teachers who were Christians. From Pisidian Antioch, we went to Perga, then down to Italia, where we sailed, back to Antioch, where the journey had started. We gathered the church together and told them how powerfully the God had opened the door to the Gentiles. The brothers welcomed us back, and we looked forward to a long time of peace. Unfortunately, peace was not going to last long. I started receiving letters and, and hearing rumors that there was dissension among the Galatian churches. Many of the Jewish Christians, especially some who were representing themselves as being from James, were stridently insisting that all new Christians, including the new Galatian Christians, should follow the laws of Moses, especially men undergo circumcision. These Jewish Christians were spiritually imprisoning these new Gentile Christians with unnecessary and counterproductive restrictions. The freedom that we had promised the new believers was, was being taken away. I fired off a long letter to my Galatian friends and began writing to ask the other apostles and, and Christian leaders for a meeting to discuss this rising danger. We Christians were overcoming the persecution of Jewish leaders, but I was now uncertain whether we could withstand the teaching of our own Jewish brothers, or if we could overcome some of the actions of Peter. Well, having reflected on the scriptures, we are going to proclaim the faith we have in Jesus Christ. And we do that by saying the words that will come up beside me from Philippians. We proclaim together, though he was divine, he did not cling to equality with God, but made himself nothing. Taking the form of a slave, he was born in human likeness. He humbled himself and was obedient to death even death on the cross. Therefore, God raised him on high and gave him the name above every other name, that at the name of Jesus, every tongue could confess and every knee bow down to proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Amen. Well, we are going to sing again now. So let us praise God through song. stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard the tender whispers of love in the dead of night, and you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone. You're a good, good father.
Praise God through song. We're going to take a moment to pray. Uh, we believe prayer changes lives. And as I've said before, you can send in your prayer requests, but we are going to pray for each other, for our community and for the world around us. So let us pray now. So as we come to a time of prayer, we pray, God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your abundance, love and grace that you give us that we know and have found through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. We thank you that you loved us so much that you sent your Son, that we are transformed by him. And we thank you for all those who daily serve you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for our world. We pray for those places that are suffering due to natural disaster, war, terror and famine. We especially pray for Ukraine, Sudan and all those other places that are still recovering from disasters and wars that have raged recently. And Lord, we pray for those victims of terror and those victims who have suffered terribly at the hands of others. We especially pray for those impacted by the stabbings in Nottingham this week, those local and those far away. We also pray for all those locally known to us who are in need or in struggling. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 
And Lord, we pray for ourselves this day, for the needs that only you know about, for those prayers that we keep praying, for the support and care that we need, and for the help to face each day. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. So Lord, as we go into this week, we ask strength for the weak. We ask courage for the disheartened. And we ask for vision for those who need it. Amen. Concluding our time of prayer, we pray the words that Jesus taught us in the form of the Lord's Prayer. So join me as we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, power and glory, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Well, having uh, worshipped together, we are going to sing our final song. But as you go into this week, may you know the power, the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, may it rest upon you now and always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. We sing our final hymn of praise together now. Just lamb of God.